I am going to give you a bit of a warning in this video today that I might be a tad testy. And that's probably out of character for me. Usually on these videos, I'm pretty calm and I try and take a measured approach and the topics I'm talking about, but I am a little bit worked up and I wanna clear the air today. There is a lot of misinformation that's floating out there um, in the YouTube space in general. And uh, you know, we're all here to learn. That's why we watch these videos. That's why we produce these videos. And part of the YouTube experience is the comment section that you read. Um, there are some people who are watching the videos who just uh, don't seem to want to learn and they uh, proliferate, they spread bad information out there by posting on our channel inaccurate comments. And my concern here is that uh, sort of at, you know, in a minor sense, they're misleading people. But at the end of the day, the biggest problem is that they may be hurting those who are trying to learn. The topic of today's video is this area of high yield ETFs. And this is one of the most quickly growing segments of the investing space that's available to Canadian investors. And there is lots of coverage. The space is getting a ton of coverage on various channels and in the media in general. Um, really, really importantly to understand here that not all high yield ETFs are the same. Different funds do things differently. There's different structures, there's different strategies that they employ, and it can be confusing I'll say that. And what does this confusion lead to? Well, it leads to doubt, it leads to suspicions in the worst case scenarios. Three of these sort of common misconceptions that I hear all the time or I read about all the time are, uh, first of all, the upside potential of covered call ETFs. Secondly, there's this concept of return of capital and what impact that has on your portfolio. And thirdly, capital erosion, something you're gonna read a lot of comments about in the space here. So we're gonna talk about those today. I would like to start by thanking Hamilton ETFs who have graciously sponsored our video today. And I'm gonna be using one of their funds to provide examples to explain the concepts I'm talking about here today. And specifically, I'm gonna use the Hamilton Canadian Financial Yield Maximizer ETF. The ticker for this fund is HMAX. And it is currently Canada's highest yielding financials ETF with a target 13% annual distribution. That is a very, very attractive distribution, obviously. And I'm gonna break down the mechanics of how that comes to be. Uh, but first, I'm gonna move on to the first of these three major misunderstandings. I'm gonna call it misconception number one. High yield funds have no growth potential. You are going to hear a lot. You're gonna hear people who maybe aren't that well versed in the space saying that if you use a covered call overlay, very popular these days, you don't have upside to the potential. So you're relying entirely on the options premium flows that come into the portfolio uh, to fund the portfolio growth. Now, I would say in the vast majority of cases, this simply is not true. To be clear, there is a scenario that that would apply. And this would be if you had a covered call portfolio where every single position at all times had covered calls written against them. And in that, that uh, scenario, you would expect that you would forego upside potential uh, for the collecting of a more a larger volume of premiums. But it is very rare that you would see this. Uh, most fund managers don't go all in on a portfolio like that. A far more common scenario is you would see here in Canada where a fund manager would write covered calls on a percentage of the portfolio, say 30% is quite common or 50%. That then leaves the rest of the portfolio to grow though. So this is a misconception. The, the, uh, the reality is that the covered call strategy, the covered call overlay limits the upside potential in pretty much all cases, but it doesn't eliminate the potential. In part of my due diligence as I was preparing for this video here, I met online with Patrick Somerville. He is the senior partner. He's the head of business development with Hamilton ETFs. I asked Patrick to speak on this topic of upside potential. I wanna share with you a bit of what he had to say on that topic. That, that. Yeah, so there's definitely, that is definitely true. Um, typically investors in covered call ETFs, they accept uh, what we call as a yield return trade-off. They have a lower long-term growth um, as basically the option strategy caps your upside potential, which as you mentioned, I think investors in these funds are, are willing to accept that trade off. And you can see that in the numbers and the growth of the of the category which we talked about earlier. Um, I think people are perfectly OK with that. If you're if you're a pure growth investor um, and income doesn't matter, then then cover call ETFs probably aren't for you. Right. And I think there's you know, this isn't a be all 
uh, strategy for for every um, risk profile. It, it's really you know meant more for you know people seeking monthly cash flow. So as you can take from Patrick's word, he's reiterating my thoughts on this that there's no doubt a limit to upside potential, but not the elimination of that. If we look at the fund I'm featuring today, HMAX, their initial target allocation is 50% of the portfolio to have calls written against it. So if we use the example half of the portfolio would you be used to generate this income, but the other half would remain to provide the growth opportunity. When we look at the Canadian banks, I mean, we know that they've done very well over time. And so without exception, without question, we would want to participate in the growth of that over time. I certainly wouldn't want to forego all of that. In my opinion, I think a fund like this really looks to hit that sweet spot. You know, it has excellent income from the covered call overlay, but it also allows for growth in the sector as well. And for a lot of investors, this makes sense to have that combination of the growth and the income. Important to note here though, another sort of misunderstanding, a portfolio like this is still subject to the, um, the downside of the market. In the financial sector, which is where this invested, if that space in general or the, the 10 holdings it has here declines, you'd expect the ETF to decline along with them because um, you, you own the companies. It's a covered call strategy. So you own the stocks in the portfolio. Um, one thing is the, the downside would be mitigated to the extent that the fund manager brings those premiums in. So um, yes, they're subject to the downside declines, but to a lesser degree than if you simply owned the companies themselves without that covered call overlay. I would like to move on now to misconception number two, which is the return of capital argument. And you're gonna hear a lot of chatter surrounding return of capital or ROC or ROC as it's, as it's called. Um, let's take a closer look at this and the difference between good rock and bad rock. But before we do that, a quick reminder that in addition to this YouTube channel, we also have our online platform that is designed to take investors from raw beginners to fully confident investors. So I will put a link in the description of this video here. A very common talking point that you're going to hear amongst the naysayers of the high yield structure of fund, something to this effect, high yield funds can't possibly generate enough income into the portfolio to pay you the distributions. So to compensate for that, they top up the distributions with return of capital, which essentially is your own money coming back to you. Important, really important to understand that with a covered call overlay, there's a different type of rock. And this is where we get into the bad rock versus uh, good rock. It's more of a taxation issue uh, rather than returning your own money to. And again, I'm going to let Pat Somerville explain his take on this overriding concept. This is a, it's a very polarizing topic, uh, return of capital. It gets a lot of um, attention. I, I think what people should look for, there's, there's basically there's two main sources of return of capital for investors to consider. The first one is what we call bad rock, um, where, where there's an encroachment of capital, where the fund is essentially just giving investors back their own money, which we just talked about. Mm -hmm. um, this is generally viewed at, you know, negatively as it's, it's not as it's clear that the fund is not able to support its distribution yield, right? So that's, that's the bad rock. But then there's, you know, the, what we call the good rock, which is a common feature of covered call ETFs. And what this is, it comes from the option strategy. So basically when premium income is earned by the fund, it's classified as a capital gain. However, at the end of the year, if the fund has realized capital losses, uh, the fund then um, uses those to offset the capital gains from the option strategy. And then this in turn, basically everything is reclassified. The premium income is reclassified as return of capital and does not harm the, the value of the fund. So it's simply just a classification for, for tax purposes, but yeah, you just want to be aware of of the bad rock where it's like I said earlier is where it's, you know, the the underlying is not earning what the fund is paying out. I think this pretty much summarizes my take on the whole um, good versus bad rock argument as well. Um, hopefully the goal here is next time you read the generic all rock is bad comment, you'll have this context to help you along your investment journey as you're making decisions to manage your own portfolio. Now, I want to move to the third misconception. You hear this a lot is the erosion of capital. And again, you're going to hear a lot of people say that the funds pay out high distributions. That's really all well and good, but this will ultimately result in the erosion of your capital. As I said at the outset, there are different types of funds, there's different types of structures. And admittedly, yes, some of these funds have what I would call a very bad track record um, to each their own. Uh, my investment style, I'm not a fan of taking a long-term investment that doesn't grow in value over time. I love the income that some of these assets generate, but I also want to grow the assets over time. I might be a little bit old school in that regard, uh, but that's how I think. And as an example, 
uh, I've done a video on this channel of uh, covering split share corporations. And a lot of these types of funds have in fact experienced negative results when it comes to their principal. A lot of the distributions in some cases are in fact return of capital. And because of this, it, it tends to give the whole high yield space a bit of a bad rap. I, I will put a link to the video for the, the video that I created some time ago. And it, it, it the goal of the video is to explain the pros and cons of these split share corporations so that you can be fully informed because that's ultimately what we're here to do, to understand what you're buying, right? In my opinion, if a fund regularly dips into the money that you yourself put there and returns that capital to you, that's what I would call bad uh, rock. And over time, in fact, it will uh, erode the, the value of the fund. Uh, again, I uh, was speaking with Pat Somerville on this and I asked him for his take on this particular issue and I really like what uh, he had to say. I'll share that with you right now. I think it's something to be aware of. I think it's probably too general of a criticism um, as not all higher yielding funds are created equal. The scenario you, you mentioned in your question there, this is really only the case when the actual funds pay out more in distributions than what the underlying holdings are earning in the portfolio. And essentially what's happening there is the manager or the, or the company of the ETF or fund is essentially grinding the net asset value of the fund. They're taking money out of the capital to fund the distribution. So to us, that's, that's not a very good proposition. I think that's a critical thing for investors to look at for sure, um, is to, to make sure that portfolios are, are earning close to what they're paying out. I fully agree 100% with what Pat has to say here. And I hope this kind of helps clear up this concept of the erosion of capital when it might apply and when it might not apply. I do want to move now to the mechanics of the, the HMAX, the, the uh, fund that we're looking at today and sort of get to the crux of the argument. The, the big question is, how does a fund like HMAX manage to pay out a 13% yield um, annually without eroding the fund? Simply put, in this case here, they are bringing a very unique style of covered call overlay to the Canadian market. And I'm really excited about this fund. Uh, they really are, it, it sort of differentiates them from the masses. Really importantly, I'm just gonna quickly add here, um, a lot of people assume that in this covered call space, the fund will use leverage to enhance their yields. Um, some funds do, but in this case, the HMAX fund does not use leverage. So I just thought I'd throw that in there to make sure that people aren't sort of automatically assuming that because that's something you might read comments about as well. The mechanics of this fund itself, uh, the fund owns Canada's 10 largest financial services companies. So it's diversified across uh, our largest banks, insurance companies, and asset managers. As we know, the Canadian financial sector is well known for its attractive dividends and consistent and reliable dividends that it pays. So because this fund, HMAX, owns these companies, they will, of course, collect the dividends. And that's uh, income source number one into the portfolio. But in addition, and this is really the kicker here, to generate the second source of income, they use an active covered call overlay. And in its current form, they will write 50% of the portfolio on at the money premiums, at the money calls, instead of the more common out of the money calls. And that generates higher premiums. Now stick with me here because I'm getting a little bit technical, but I really wanna explain how the math works on this. And I'm gonna use um, HMAX as the example here. They own all of the, the, the major Canadian banks. I'm gonna use Bank of Nova Scotia as the example here. At the time that this video was filmed, Bank of Nova Scotia was trading for $72.91 a share. If we look at the options chain on this, we can see that the bid price for a $73, so let's call that at the money option, 30 days out is $1.51. If we compare that to an option that is trading even a couple of bucks out of the money, so we're looking here at a $75 option, we see that that price drops to 63 cents. That's the extra value that writing at the money uh, can bring the portfolio as opposed to writing the, the more common out of the money. So getting into the math here, if the fund sells that 30 day at the money call option for a buck 51 on their whole position, that would be $1.51 divided by 72.91 or roughly a 2% yield. If you annualize this now, you would take that times 12. So you get a roughly 24.85% annualized yield. If you then use the target coverage of 50% of the fund, so remember they're not doing the whole fund, they're doing 50%, you cut that in half and you get down to 12.43%. Now, when you take the regular dividend and add to that, and currently Bank of Nova Scotia is paying a 5.64% yield. If you take the 12.43 that's generated from the option strategy itself, you add that to the 5.64 yield from the, the normal dividends, you get a total of just over 18% as of the current date. 
Now, in this example, that obviously more than covers that target of 13%. Uh, there's no doubt, uh, obviously, this will vary from month to month. This is one example. They own 10 different companies in the portfolio right now. So there's going to be roughly, you know, there's going to be some variations, but I, I hope this gives you sort of the, the mathematical concept of how the fund can generate this type of income to pay that targeted 13% yield. Um, in this example as well, as I mentioned, you are sacrificing that 50% upside because it is in fact uh, capped by these call options. Now, if we compare that 13% targeted yield to um, to their peers, to the, the competition out there, a typical covered call ETF today yields around 7.82%. But if you go to the weighted average yield on the big six banks, you can see the stark difference here of 4.59% versus the funds that use these covered call overlays, or in this case, the uh, the more attractive, if you're looking for income, um, at the money strategy. So as you can see, if you're an investor uh, who places a high priority on the uh, current income that you're generating in your portfolio, and you're willing to forego some of that upside potential, this certainly could be something that you might wanna look at. It might be a good addition uh, to your portfolio. As I said at the outset, it's really hard to know who to believe uh, when you're reading comments on social media, when you're watching videos like this. Um, there's a lot of confusion out there. Uh, don't be too hard on yourself if this is not something that comes very clearly. Uh, sometimes you have to really look at it and of course use critical thinking. Don't take anything at face value that you see on, on YouTube. And I would uh, include, of course, our channel on that. Hear what we have to say, but do your own homework to make sure that we know what we're talking about as well. That's what this video is for. The video is designed to help clear up these misconceptions. Now, if you are the type of investor who likes high income yields like this, you're looking for other high yield funds as well, I will put a link here to another video that Brandon prepared talking about a couple of Hamilton funds. I would encourage you to check that out. Um, as always, we do have uh, our investing academy. I will put a link in the video description below. And I thank you for watching this video. I really look forward to seeing you in the next video.